Come, come, have a seat. Gather around. Sit, sit, come closer, come closer. Wait, stop, 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 that's too close. Now let me tell you a little story. About a greedy ghost and his four-eyed cat companion, which is not a ghost, by the way, and a powerful, ancient sidearm carried by a powerful and ancient warrior from another dimension. Because why not? We're going to talk about Uncle Karlov, Lurus, and Umezawa's Jite. Welcome to the Commander's Beacon. I am Eric, and this channel is dedicated to unconventional commander decks and strategies. And oh man, do I have a deal for you today! Now you know how most commander decks only have one commander? Or maybe, just maybe, two commanders? Well today we've got not one, not two, but three commanders. Sort of. First, there's Karlov of the Ghost Council. Uncle Karlov, as he's known, is a 2-2 legendary spirit advisor. It costs just two mana, a white-black, and whenever you gain life, you put two plus one plus one counters on Karlov. You can also pay white-black and remove six plus one plus one counters from Karlov to exile target creature. So Karlov's game plan is pretty obvious. It wants you to gain life many, many times. Karlov will get bigger when you do, and Karlov can also make itself smaller to get rid of pesky creatures. Now we'll also use a companion, Lurus of the Dream Den. Companion is a mechanic introduced in Ikoria that was generally considered so broken that wizards had to errata the mechanic after release, and many of the ten companions are still banned in some non-rotating formats. If you want to know more about the companion mechanic, I made a whole video about it, you can check that out here. Anyways, Lurus is a 3-2 Nightmare Cat that costs one Orzov Orzov. It has lifelink, and during each of your turns you may cast one permanent spell with mana value 2 or less from your graveyard. And if Lurus is your companion, which it will be for this deck, uh, it restricts your deck building such that each permanent card in your deck must have mana value 2 or less, and so our deck has no permanent cards that cost more than 2 mana. And lastly we need to talk about Umezawa's Jite. This is a legendary equipment that costs 2 mana. It costs 2 to equip, and it has whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage, you put 2 charge counters on Umezawa's Jite. And you can remove a charge counter from Umezawa's Jite to choose 1. The equipped creature gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn, or target creature gets minus 1 minus 1 until end of turn, or you gain 2 life. So Umezawa's Jite is a cool, multifunctional equipment. I like that it gets those charge counters whenever the equipped creature deals damage to anything. A player, a creature, or a planeswalker, it doesn't have to be damaged to a player. So that's very useful. I also like that those last two modes for spending the charge counters, uh, that is giving a creature minus one minus one until end of turn, or gaining two life, those can be activated even if the GTA is unequipped, which is also very cool. So our game plan with this deck is first to find Umezawa's GTA. This is our hidden commander in this deck. We want to put charge counters on Umezawa's Jite as fast as possible. We'll use those charge counters to gain life, and when we do, Karlov will get plus one plus one counters. We've got a few ways to close out games when Karlov is sufficiently big, and Lurus is great insurance to protect our Umezawa's Jite should it ever get destroyed. Not to mention the general graveyard recursion value that Lurus provides for all of our other permanents. Now let's go over the contents of this deck, starting with the quest to find Umezawa's Jite. Now this deck is built around Umezawa's Jite, but of course it isn't our commander or our companion, so it will reside somewhere in the 99, which means we'll need plenty of tutors to find it. I'm not running the super expensive and powerful tutors here like Vampiric Tutor or Demonic Tutor, but if you want to power the deck up, you definitely could use these. But even with our companion limitation of having no permanence with mana value 3 or greater in this deck, we still have plenty of ways to find the Jite. Wishclaw Talisman is a basically a budget vampiric tutor, well as long as you're willing to share with your opponents. We do have a few ways to break the symmetry of Wishclaw Talisman, primarily by sacrificing it in response to its activation, but we'll talk about those sacrifice effects later. We'll use Open the Armory and Steel Shaper's Gift. These are single-use spells that find us any equipment, or an aura alternatively in the case of Open the Armory. 
Relic Seeker and Quest for the Holy Relic are both slow equipment tutors. Uh, Relic Seeker has Renown, so when it deals combat damage to a player, if it isn't Renowned, it becomes Renowned. And when it becomes Renowned, you get to tutor an equipment out of your deck and into your hand. Quest for the Holy Relic costs a single white, and it gets a quest counter whenever you cast a creature spell. And you can remove 5 quest counters from it and sacrifice it to tutor an equipment card from your deck into your hand. Of course there's Stoneforge Mystic, which is very effective tutoring equipment to your hand as an ETB effect on a body and for only 2 mana. But this card is also $50, so keep that in mind, it's not a budget card. Speaking of non-budget cards, we'll also use Entomb. This instant costs single mana unless you search your library for any card and put it into your graveyard. And because we've got Lurus in this deck, we can reliably cast that card from our graveyard if it's a permanent, like Umazawa's Jite. Lastly, if you're still having trouble finding Umazawa's Jite, we've got Inventor's Fair, which is a tutor on a land, albeit a fairly costly one. By paying 4 and tapping and sacrificing Inventor's Fair, you can, you can tutor any artifact to your hand from your library, but you can only activate this ability if you control 3 or more artifacts. So that's step 1, finding Umazawa's Jite. Now don't worry, if you happen to draw your Jite naturally or you draw multiple tutors, we do have plenty of other enticing equipments that are worth tutoring out of this deck, that are good alternative targets for those tutors. So next, let's talk about how we'll generate charge counters on the Jite as fast as possible. And one of the best ways to put charge counters on Umazawa's Jite quickly is with Double Strike. Because Umazawa's Jite gets two charge counters whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage. So a creature with Double Strike, which hits twice, will give the Jite four charge counters every time it engages in combat. That means four life gain triggers and eight plus one plus one counters for Karlov. Now I've also experimented with proliferate effects, but I found that Double Strike was just generally faster at putting counters on Jite. And so, we'll use all of the cheap double strikers that we can get. Core Duelist has double strike as long as it's equipped, which is the only time it really matters in this deck. Dorned Pouncer, Fencing Ace, and Core Blade Master have double strike all the time. As does Twin Blade Geist, and it can also be cast from your graveyard as an aura for its disturbed cost. And when you do this, the enchanted creature has double strike. You probably won't do this though, because if that aura would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, you exile it instead and you'd really rather cast it from your graveyard with Lurus. And that's true of all of these other double strike creatures too. They may be small and unimposing, and they may have a hard time surviving combat when you're trying to put charge counters on the Jite, but it doesn't matter so much when you have Lurus to recur them from your graveyard when they die. Now we'll also use Paladin class. Uh, when this enchantment is leveled up to 3, which is kind of expensive by the way, uh, costing a total of 8 mana plus the one to cast Paladin class, but at level 3, Paladin class gives one of your attacking creatures double strike during each of your attack steps, among other benefits. Now I also want to mention Buried Alive. For 3 mana, the sorcery lets you search your library for up to 3 creature cards and put them into your graveyard. So if you're having trouble finding one of your double strike creatures, or maybe an equipment tutor like Stoneforge Mystic, Buried Alive can help you out, and Lurus will let you cast those creatures once you've tutored them into your graveyard. Okay, so now we're able to put counters on Umazawa's GT quickly, Again, up to 4 counters during each of our attack steps if we've got a double striking creature. And even more if we're able to then move the GT onto another creature after combat, and block with it during an opponent's attack step. And now let's talk about how we'll use those GT counters to win the game. So our goal in this deck is to use Umazawa's Jite to gain life, and turn that life into plus one plus one counters for Karlov. Once Karlov is big, we've got a few ways to win the game. First, and most simply, is combat damage. Karlov doesn't have any evasion, but we have a few ways to help it get in for commander damage. And since a double striking creature wearing a Jite will essentially give Karlov eight plus one plus one counters all by itself each attack step, on top of any other life gain effects we've got, uh, getting to 21 commander damage is not very difficult. So we've got Rogue's Passage, which can make Karlov unblockable. There's All Seed of Life's Bounty, which can sacrifice itself to give Karlov protection from a color. In other words, making it unblockable by creatures of that color. Or we can just make it completely unblockable with Wedding Invitation. This 2-mana artifact draws us a card when it enters the battlefield, 
and we can tap and sacrifice it to make target creature unblockable this turn. By the way, both All Seed of Life's Bounty and Wedding Invitation can be reused repeatedly from our graveyard with Luris after we sacrifice them. Shadow Spear can give Karlov Trample, which can help us brute force our commander damage through some blockers. But we don't need to attack to kill with Karlov. Dying Wish is a 2 mana aura that enchants a creature you control. It has, whenever the enchanted creature dies, target player loses X life and you gain X life or X is its power. Now with the Sacrifice Outlet, Dying Wish lets us kill Karlov on demand and hit any opponent really hard. And we'll talk about our Sacrifice Outlets later. And don't forget, again, we have Lurus, so we can reuse Dying Wish from our graveyard over and over again. And then there's Sure Strike Trident. I end up talking about this card a lot. I'm not sure whether it's underplayed or if it's just not that good, but I like the card anyways. Now this is an equipment, so we can tutor for it. It costs two and equips for four. Uh, the equipped creature gets first strike, which we don't care about, but more importantly, you can tap the equipped creature and unattach Sure Strike Trident to have that creature deal damage equal to its power to target player. So again, Karlov can snipe players without ever getting into combat. So those are our win conditions that reward us for growing Karlov, but we've also got lots of redundancies in this deck that let us keep on going with our game plan, even if we don't have Karlov or Umazawa's GT or even Luris. So let's talk about those redundancies next. Now I like having backup plans in my decks, and what I really like about this deck is that we have lots of redundancies for our otherwise very particular game plan. Luris gives us some protection against our Umazawa's Jite getting destroyed, but we have other backup plans in this deck in case the GTA is exiled or in case we never find it in the first place. First, we can give any of our double striking creatures lifelink, because this essentially does the same thing as Umazawa's GTA, at least as far as Uncle Karlov is concerned, though admittedly it is a bit weaker. Shadow Spear, Felidar Umbra, and Rune of Sustenance all give an equipped or enchanted creature lifelink, so our double striking creatures will get two life gain triggers per combat, which of course isn't as good as getting four triggers from the GTA but as a backup option, it's still decent. And again, all of these are permanents that Luris can recur for us from our graveyard if we need to. There's also Spirit Loop, which grants lifelink and kindly recurs itself. We've got some replacements for Karlov as well if we need them. Uh, Johnny's Pride Maid and Voice of the Blessed each get a plus one plus one counter each time you gain life. Again, this backup plan is only half as effective as Karlov, uh, since Karlov gets two plus one plus one counters when you gain life, but it's still a pretty decent way to get a big creature and win the game with your Dying Wish or Rogue's Passage or whatnot. There's also Cleric Class, which when leveled up to level 2, lets you put a plus one plus one counter on a target creature you control whenever you gain life. And then we've also got some additional protection for Karlov. Now I like that Karlov is cheap at only 2 mana, so we can cast Karlov many times before that commander tax starts to slow us down, but it still can, and that's why I've included Netherborn Altar. Uh, you can tap this 2 mana artifact and put a soul counter on it, and then you put your commander into your hand from your command zone. Then you lose 3 life for each soul counter on Netherborn Altar. Basically, you're trading commander tax for life, which is fine since we're playing a life gain deck. Of course, if paying for those soul counters ever becomes too taxing, you can always just sacrifice your Netherborn Altar and then recast it from your graveyard with Luris to reset its soul counters. And again, we'll talk about our sacrifice outlets later. So in any case, your opponents will need a lot of removal to deal with Karla for long. Now we've also got redundancy for Luris in the form of other graveyard recursion. A Savin's Reclamation is a white staple that can be used twice due to flashback, and it returns any permanent with a mana value of 3 or less. What do you know, that's all of our permanents. Uh, returns one of those permanents from your graveyard to the battlefield. There's Restoration Specialist. This is a 2 mana creature that can sacrifice itself to return up to one target artifact and up to one target enchantment from your graveyard to your hand. Phyrexian Reclamation is an enchantment that lets you pay 1 and a black and 2 life to return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand whenever you want. Again, this is a life gain deck, so paying 2 life each time is fairly trivial for us. Takanuma Abandoned Mire lets us recur a creature card from our graveyard to your hand, or it can just be a land if you need that. And Buried Ruin is also a land that you can sacrifice to return an artifact from your graveyard to your hand. So these can help us recur stuff from our graveyard in case Luris is dealt with. Or of course we can just use some of these to recur Luris, and then use Luris to recur other stuff from our graveyard. 
Okay, so those are some of our redundancies that help keep our game plan going, even under non-optimal conditions. Now let's talk about some of the other strategies that make this deck work. Okay, so we've been talking a bit now about sacrificing things for value. So how do we actually do that? Claws of Gix lets us sacrifice any permanent at any time for just one mana. And even better, we gain one life when we do, so we'll trigger Karlov and all of our other life gain payoffs. There's High Market and Phyrexia's Core, which are lands that double as sacrifice outlets for creatures or artifacts respectively. And again, they also gain us life. Dockside Chef lets us pay one and a black and sacrifice an artifact or a creature to draw a card. And Reckoner's Bargain is a single-use sacrifice effect. It's an instant that has an additional cost, you have to sacrifice an artifact or a creature to cast it. And then you'll gain life equal to that permanent's mana value, and you draw two cards. And so this is great because it's a sacrifice outlet, a life gain trigger, and card draw all in one, and we care about all of these things. So again, these sacrifice outlets are multifunctional in this deck. Maybe we're sacrificing our Umazawa's Jite in response to a return to dust or something uh, to send it to our graveyard to protect it from getting exiled. Maybe we're resetting our soul counters on Netherborn Altar. Maybe we're sacrificing a creature enchanted with Dying Wish to push through some damage. There's a lot that we can do with these sacrifice outlets in this deck. Now even though we're focused on using Umazawa's Jite as our main life gain plan, we will use other life gain effects as well, and these will grow Karlov and trigger our other life gain payoffs. So of course there's the Soul Sisters, which gain us life whenever another creature enters the battlefield. Authority of the Consoles and Blind Obedience will slow our opponents down while gaining us life in the process. A Basilica Screecher and Tithe Drinker have Extort, so we can gain even more life with each spell we cast. Sun Droplet can gain us up to four life gain triggers for each round of the table in a four-player game, uh, as long as we're taking some damage. Uh, this is a two-mana artifact that has, whenever you're dealt damage, put that many charge counters on Sun Droplet, and then at the beginning of each upkeep, you can remove one charge counter to gain one life. I'm also using Implement of Improvement, and this is mostly here as Lurus Fodder. Now, this one mana artifact lets you pay white and sacrifice it to gain two life, and when it's put into the graveyard from the battlefield, you draw a card. So this is not super great by itself, but if you can cast this out of your graveyard each turn with Lurus, you will accrue decent value over time. Now because we have Lurus to recur cards from our graveyard, we'll also have access to some repeatable removal spells. A Cathar Commando, for example, is a 3-1 that can sacrifice itself to destroy a target artifact or enchantment. And again, with Lurus, it's reusable. But the same is true with Executioner's Capsule and Dispeller's Capsule, and these can sacrifice themselves to destroy a target creature, or destroy a target artifact or enchantment, respectively. We've got other removal as well that provides a lot of synergy with our deck. Now, there's Hopeful Initiate, which lets you pay 2 and a white and remove 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters from among creatures you control, to destroy target artifact or enchantment. So this is a great alternative use for Karlov's plus one plus one counters. Erebos's Intervention and Heliod's Intervention are flexible removal spells at instant speed that might gain us some life at the same time. Austere Command is already a good generic board wipe, but we can use it here to destroy all creatures with mana value four or greater, which does absolutely nothing to us, but it can decimate our opponents who probably aren't restricted to playing with permanents with mana value 2 or less. There's also Dusk to Dawn. Uh, Dusk is a sorcery that destroys all creatures with power 3 or greater. Now this will kill Karlov and our occasional Ajani's pride mates or whatnot, but many of our creatures will not be affected by Dawn. And then we can cast Dusk from our graveyard, which returns all creatures with power 2 or less from our graveyard to our hand. And again, that's going to be almost all of our creatures. So this is both a board wipe that many of our creatures will dodge, and it's excellent graveyard recursion. Now for ramp, we don't have much in this deck, and we really don't need it too much because our average mana value in this deck is very, very low. But we will use Wayfarer's Bobble, which can be reused with Lurus, and Knight of the White Orchid, which can also hold equipment for us and get involved in combat if needed. Now we care much more about Kardra in this deck. A Sunset Pyramid, Maze Mine Tome, and Reckoner's Bank Buster are all limited use card draw artifacts that let us pay two mana to draw a card a few times. But we can also sacrifice them and then recast them with Loris to reset those counters and let us keep using them if we need to. Dawn of Hope makes bodies for us, and it lets us pay two whenever we gain life to draw a card. 
Arguable's Bloodfast lets us turn life into cards, which again is great in a life gain deck. Necrologia does the same as a powerful single use effect that can easily refill your hand at the cost of some life. Now for lands, we'll use Witch's Clinic. Uh, this lets us pay 2 and tap it to give our commander lifelink until end of turn. This can be great for padding our life total if Karlov is really big. And a lot of the Zendikar Rising MDFC lands are great here as well. Malakir Rebirth and Sejiri Step are additional protection for our creatures. Skyclave Cleric and Zoff Consumption can be single-use life gain triggers. Shambling Vent is a land that can become a creature with lifelink. And Bonders Enclave, Castle Lockwain, and War Room, these can give us even more card draw, and some of these will cost us life to activate, but again, we're a life gain deck, so we, we can usually afford to pay that cost. So that is most of the deck. Now I haven't covered everything, but as always, you can check out the deck link in the description for the full list. Now let's move on to the deck stats and cost. This Uncle Karlov, Lurus, and Umazawa's GT deck has an average mana value of just 1.99. Of course, because Lurus is our companion, we can't play any permanents with a mana value of 3 or greater, so this isn't surprising. We have 25 cards in this deck that can gain us life, so these will trigger Karlov or any of our other life gain payoffs. Now many of these are repeatable, but some are single use, like Reckoner's Bargain, and some have additional costs, like Claws of Gix. We have 4 life gain payoffs in this deck, not counting Karlov. That's not a lot, so this deck is highly centered around the commander. Most of our life gain effects are primarily for Karlov's benefit. Though again, we do have redundancies, like Cleric class. This deck has 2 ramp spells and 12 card advantage spells. Again, we're not using much ramp here because our mana cost is so low, so refilling our hand is a much bigger concern in this deck uh, than ramping is. We have three lands that can help us draw cards if necessary as well, which I didn't count among our card draw spells. This deck has 10 pieces of single target removal, many of them recurrable with Lurus, and two board wipes. At the time of this recording, this deck has a value of $463.22, so while this deck is not obscenely expensive, it's also definitely not a budget deck. I decided to increase the budget for this deck over what I typically build, since we will need tutors to find Umazawa's Jite, and many of the available tutors, like Entomb or Stoneforge Mystic, are fairly costly. If we reduce the deck budget, we might need to rely on inefficient tutors like Diabolic Tutor, which would slow the deck down a lot. Also, Umazawa's Jite and Karlov are both over $20 each, so it's not really possible to build this deck on a very tight budget. And that is the deck. Now I love building decks with secret commanders, that is a card that's in the 99 of a deck that the deck is still centered around, like Umazawa's Jite in this case. Now it can be challenging because you need to have ways to find that secret commander, you need methods to protect it since it won't go to the command zone if it's removed, and you'll need methods to effectively utilize that secret commander to win the game and make all of those necessary support cards worthwhile. Umazawa's Jite is a fun and versatile piece because it can gain life, kill small creatures, or buff the equipped creature. And again, in this deck, we'll double dip and we'll get life gain and plus one plus one counters on Karlov at the same time. Now, I really like the low mana value in this deck, so you won't have trouble getting your game plan going. And because we have redundancies for our commander, for our companion, and for Umazawa's Jite, this deck has a lot of resilience to deal with having its key pieces removed. But do be aware of graveyard hate effects. You know, effects that exile your graveyard can really eliminate the deck's resilience. But that is all I've got for today. If you enjoyed this video, please click that like button, or subscribe if you haven't already, or leave a comment. Or better yet, check out our Discord where you can discuss commander deck building or maybe play some games. And if you want to support the channel directly, check out our Patreon. Thanks to all of my patrons who help out the channel. The patrons get to vote on upcoming content and more. You can find the link to the Discord and the Patreon in the description. Thank you for watching, we'll see you next time.
Bye.